subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update. Join the only official Telegram channel of Rao's IA Study Circle to get relevant material and important updates. Hello everyone and welcome to the weekly edition of Daily News Simplify, where we take up the articles which are published in the explained section of the Indian Express throughout the week and also the Sunday edition of the Hindu newspaper. Articles which are taken for today's discussion are listed on your screen and the timestamping for these articles is already given in the description box. So let us begin with the first article for the day. This article of Indian Express Explained section appeared on 16th of April that is yesterday and talks about the importance of oil bonds in determining the prices of oil in India and also the role of oil bond in the government's overall fiscal deficit and its ability to spend on India. The government has argued recently that it cannot reduce the oil prices as it has to pay for oil bonds which were issued by the previous government. Now, as far as oil bonds are concerned, it is important for the student to understand what the oil bonds are all about and how they actually function. The content of the article would include everything about the oil bonds, why oil bonds are issued, the trends of oil bonds and oil bonds versus taxes. Now let us understand the entire article through this slide. The oil prices in India and many other countries are determined by two basic purposes. First one being the taxes which are imposed and the basic cost price. The cost price of oil is determined by the fuel price, transportation cost both from the oil fields to India and from the Indian refineries to the respective destinations of states. Then it also includes the insurance of transportation, service charges included as well as the cost of refinery. As far as taxes are concerned, it is imposed after the production of final output that is after the fractional distillation. And this is imposed as a matter of duty both by union as well as by the state. As of now, around 45 to 50 percent of the fuel price, let's say the fuel price is 110 rupees per liter, which simply means that 55 rupees will be imposed as the part of taxation. So, India is one of those rare nations across the world where tax on fuel is as high as the cost price. And when cost price of fuel equals the taxes, it becomes a matter of concern as it is becoming in India. Now, why the oil prices are high? The first reason being simple that there is a high level of speculation going on in the international oil prices. It is not a matter that there is a sudden fall in the supply. It is not a mismatch of supply overall. The more important point being the fluctuation because of the speculation in the oil market. And this oil market fluctuation is based on the Russian-Ukraine war which is going on. The second reason which is being forwarded by the government is the situation of oil bonds. Now what are oil bonds and why government is concerned about paying on these oil bonds? Well, previous government during the global meltdown of 2008 and 9 brought up this idea to reimpose the oil bond concept on India. Now, this was brought in order to reduce the burden on people with high prices of oil as well as avoiding the high taxation shift towards the people. Government decided this when the prices of oil was extremely high during 2008 to 10 period, which also showed some other fluctuations even till 2013. Now how government did this? Now government started issuing the oil bonds. These oil bonds were issued to the oil companies like IOCL, BPCL, HPCL and others. These oil companies will buy the bond and whatever is going to be paid on those bonds with respect to the interest will be paid by the government in order to reduce the burden on the companies. Now let us understand how this happened. Let us assume because of the high price rise, there is a deficit of earning to Bharat Petroleum Corporation Limited at an amount of 100 crore rupees. And with this amount, the company cannot sustain for long. And we know that once large companies which are based on the capital goods start declining, that leads to the decline of the economy. So companies which are involved in coal, companies which are involved in steel or maybe companies which are involved in transportation, oil production and many other capital goods cannot be taken under granted 
to put them into risk. So what government will do? Government will come forward. Either they will raise the taxation and that taxation will be covered from the public and that money will be paid to these companies to meet their losses. But what if government does not want to raise the taxation? From where the government will get money? The government will get money by issuing bonds. These bonds will have 8% interest rate which will not be paid by the companies but will be paid by the government. And once this is brought into practice, the most important negative impact is that higher interest rate put burden on the future generation. And this future generation is the current generation. So the bonds which were issued at the time of 2010 is now putting pressure of higher taxation on the fuel prices in the current generation 2022. This was the idea which was highlighted by our ex-Prime Minister Man Mohan Singh also, who said that oil bonds is going to put pressure in the future generation and that is what, what is actually happening. But the matter of concern is that is all these bonds are really a burden on the government. Can government actually sideline the real reason behind the higher fuel prices with that of the oil bonds? Government previously has argued that whatever it is providing under Pradhan Mantri Galib Kalyan Yojana with respect to free food is going to be paid by higher taxation. Government has imposed the higher taxation in order to recover 56,000 crore rupees on its deficit in order to pay for those people who have been going through the hardships during the COVID crisis. Now let us look into some of the statistics which is given in the article itself. If you go through the table on the left side, it simply shows that the outstanding money on the government is 1,34,423 crore rupees, which is a very high money. It is almost equivalent to many of the principal subsidies given by the government. However, this is not a single year money. In 2022, that is the current financial year, government is about to pay around 22,000 crore rupees, which is far less than what government is actually getting from the taxation. Now, the table on the right side shows that how much government or the oil sector is paying to the government from this taxation. It shows around 7 lakh crore rupees, which is almost 35 times the amount of money government has to pay through the oil bonds. This table proves that the oil bond argument of higher rights price is not finding higher support of the government in the parliament. However, from the perspective of the examination, it is important for the student to understand what are oil bonds, how they are issued, to whom they are issued and how they function in India. With this article in place, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article appeared on 12th of April in Indian Express Explain section and this article talks about an important historical event that is the megalithic age across India. The article says that there has been a recent discovery with respect to the megalithic stones which were found in Assam's Dima Hasao district and has been showing some evidences of India's northeast connected to Southeast Asia dating back to 2nd millennium BC. Now from the perspective of UPSC it is important under the prelim examination as questions could be put up with respect to the ancient civilization across India. This article clearly proves that the mongoloid race which is found in northeastern part of India is not indigenous to India. However, it is assumed that they might have migrated to the northeastern part of India centuries ago or even millenniums ago. The civilization which was going on in the state of Assam almost 4000 years ago shows some evidences which are closely related to Laos and Indonesia in Southeast Asia. And this connection has proved that India had some past international relations or connections with respect to the movement of people as well as the civilizations. Previously what we had evidences were were limited to the Indus Valley civilization with its relation to Sumerian civilization or relation to the Egyptian civilization. But now India's other civilizations or even the ancient locations have been proved to have connections with countries outside India or Indian subcontinent. 
Now, article proves that there has been a discovery with respect to the megalithic stone jars. See, there are two types of jars which are found in ancient India. The first one being which are constructed using clay. Clay jars are mostly concentrated in those areas where alluvial soil or clay soil is in abundance. We have examples of painted grey wares. We have examples of black polished northern ware and many others. But these kind of jars which were found in Assam's are stone jars. That means they were carved out of stones. And they were cited for the first time in 1929 by some British civil servants, James Philip Mills and John Henry Hutton. The location which includes six important sites in Dima Hassau district of Assam. The findings prove that in one of the places that is Nuchu Banglo, as many as 546 stone jars were found, which clearly proves that the civilization was very vibrant and highly populous. Now, what is the important significance of this finding? First, it proves that there was a linkage between the stone jars which are found in Assam to the jars which are found in Laos and Indonesia. So, same kind of technology and design were used which proves that some kind of cultural relations existed between these two areas. The second significance is that similar practices of mortuaries that is related to the dead people where human skeleton remains were found inside and buried around the jars. So jars were connected to the mortuary, jars were connected to the human life, jars were considered to be auspicious for humans after death. That is after life, these jars were considered auspicious for the human beings. The similar were also found in the Indus Valley civilization where clay or terracotta jars were found in abundance inside the burials. It also shows that there was a practice of keeping the bones of the ancestors as repository. Currently, these are also practiced by some of the tribes found in northeastern India such as Mikhir, Sakchips, Hunkals, Kuki, Khashi and Sintangs. These are the tribes which are practicing the similar process even today. And the third point clearly proves that the tribes which are found in these places also are the tribes which inhabited these areas for past many, many years. This could have possibly been around four to 5,000 years before present. Now, let us understand what megalithic age is all about. Megalithic simply means large stone. Mega here stands for large and lithic here stands for stone. Similarly, we have other ages such as Paleolithic, we have Mesolithic and also Neolithic. Apart from that, after these three important ages, there was Calcolithic where the rise of copper use was seen in abundance across the subcontinent. Megalithic is a stone which is larger in size and has been used to construct the monuments or some of the structures. When this art was refined, it was brought down to micro objects such as jars. As you can see, this is one of the evidence of megalithic found in South India, especially in the state of Tamil Nadu where this age was vibrant. These monument or the structures have been constructed either alone or they were put together using the other stones. The megalithic actually started at the end of Neolithic and continued into Calcolithic, Bronze Age and even the Iron Age. Even some of the evidences according to the historians prove that Sangam Age in and around the Madurai, which is the existing Tamil Nadu, had some direct linkages with the megalithic age people. The megalithic age can further be divided into two, polylithic that is use of multiple stones for the construction and the second one being monolithic using single stone for the purpose. Most of the jars which were found belong to the monolithic stones. These are the important sites that are known for their megalithic structure. As you can see, most of these sites are found in central India or in southern India. This include Nilaskar, Hire Benkel, Chambir Tomb, Dolmens, Hanam Sagar, Kudakallu and Juna Panni. All these important sites could be asked by the UPSC in the prelim examination this year or maybe the next year. Now as far as location of the finding is concerned, this is the Dima Hajau district of Assam and it is situated on the southern part of Assam state. 
With this discussion in place, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article appeared in Indian Express Explained section on 13th of April and talks about the recent move taken by the government of Karnataka in order to bring eggs in midday meal for improving the protein intake by the students. Now, the article actually revolves around the whole issue of bringing eggs into the midday meal scheme and whether it should be implemented or not. From the perspective of UPSC, such kind of arguments are not beneficial. However, for the preparation of this examination, government schemes are necessary. So, we'll look into the prelims pointer for this scheme in the upcoming examination. As per the National Family Health Survey, 35% of India's children are stunted and 20% of them are wasted. Because of this condition, India has been imposing more and more schemes in order to improve the nutrition of students, especially children under the age of 15. We also have many other schemes such as National Food Security Act, which provide subsidized food to poor families. We have Portion Abhyan, which focus directly towards countering the malnutrition in the country, both on children and women. We also have programs like Indra Dhanush, which targets the immunization among children. Apart from this midday meal scheme, which has been running over past 27 years in India, has been the prime tool for the government to target the nutrition as well as to bring children back to school who are largely dropout. This scheme has definitely provided more impetus than many other schemes in order to bring children to school and reduce the dropout rate. So let us look into some of the prelims pointer of this scheme and see what it has to offer. Midday Meal Scheme is a centrally sponsored scheme where the funding is shared between center and the state in the ratio of 60 to 40, 60 being center and 40 being state. For hilly areas and backward states, the ratio remains 90 to 10. The objective of the scheme is straightforward and it wants to enhance the enrollment, retention as well as attention of students apart from improving their nutritional levels. The scheme is extended to the upper primary level that is till the age of 14 which is also part of right to education. So now children going to the school between the age of 6 to 14 will get free food to eat once a day and also free education under right to education. Food items which are provided in this scheme are based on the EGMA quality which is highest food quality given in India and Two to three adults which are part of the school are having the responsibility of tasting the meal before the student to ensure the quality. If midday meal is not provided inside the school to the student, state government is liable to pay food security allowances for this failure. It covers children of all government school, children who are studying in local body or the government aided primary and upper primary schools students under education guarantee scheme, students under alternative innovation education such as madrasas, maktabas and others which are being covered under Sarva Siksha Abhiyan. Now the question arises that what is this Sarva Siksha Abhiyan? Well Sarva means universal. So it is the educational scheme to provide universal access to all the children right to education. It is India's flagship scheme for the achievement of universalization of elementary education. Elementary education here simply means till the standard 8th. This scheme is part of government's initiative to fulfill its requirement under right to education. The nutritional requirement provided to the students are as follows. As per the primary that is till the class 5th, 450 calories and 12 grams of protein is provided. If a student is at the age of upper primary, that is till 8th, they are provided 700 calories and 20 grams of protein. Along with this, government is also providing funds to certain NGOs. And these NGOs have the duty to provide cooked food, finally cooked food, to the students, to the schools nearby. Many NGOs including Akshay Patra have taken this responsibility of providing the cooked food to the students in the nearby schools for meeting the midday meal. If you want to read more on India's midday meal and its basic analysis, 
we have covered the same in 19th of July 2021 DNS where we have taken up the detail analysis of this scheme. You can go through all the detailed data, its benefit, way forwards, limitations and whatnot. To go to this video, you can follow the link which is also mentioned in the description box. With this discussion place, now we come to the end of today's daily news simplify and we will go through the question of the day. This article appeared in today's the Hindu newspaper in frequently asked questions. This article is talking about India's prospect with respect to the wheat exports. Now India is one of the largest producer of wheat. Despite that, India is not the largest exporter of wheat. The reason being simple, the domestic demand of wheat is very high in India vis-a-vis -vis other countries like Russia. Now wheat is a temperate crop. It requires low temperature without frost. And this is the quality which is available in Central Asia and the Siberian plains. Now this is one of the reasons why Russia, Central Asia and Eastern Europe is known to produce a high quality of wheat that too for the export purposes. Now we all know that there is a Russian-Ukraine war which is going on and that is one of the reason why these two nations are not focusing more on exporting wheat. But what about the international demand? People across the world need food to survive. That is the reason why India is trying to fill up the gap of exports in wheat output. Government of India in the past one month has seen a quantum jump as far as wheat exports are concerned. Government is claiming that India is going to produce more than 120 million tons of wheat this year. And given the kind of requirement under the National Food Security Act, India can easily export more than 20 million tons, which is more than the demand met by Russia. So as we know, Russia have affected the wheat export from the wheat from the Black Sea, the reason which has remained shut down for a while now. And this has impacted the food security across the country, especially in Africa and West Asia. Now, Egypt, which is one of the largest importer of wheat in the world, is trying to create more demand for India. Russia, which is a leader as far as wheat export is concerned, exports around 15% of the global share. Now, if India wants to have better participation, India has to meet this global demand through its excess supply. India in last financial year has exported around 7.85 million ton, which is almost four times to what India used to do previously. And this has clearly proved that India is filling the gap of wheat exports in global market. And because of this reason, as India can produce better quality of wheat at competitive prices, acceptable quality and availability of surplus instance along with geopolitical reason, because India is a more politically stable country than others. There is no war situation in India. India's defense sector is also better. India's supply chain is also better. And India produces at a lower price. All these reasons have combined together to make India one of the most favorable and most sought after country as far as wheat exports are concerned. That is the reason why countries like Egypt, Jordan, East African nations, Sri Lanka, and even our neighbor Bangladesh has shifted their support towards the wheat produced in India. Now, as far as way forward is concerned, India should try to leverage this and export more wheat in order to capture the market in the future as well. If India turns out to be a good importer as far as wheat is concerned, where Western countries have been holding the monopoly, India would be able to create its own demand for other agricultural produce by generating the confidence in the importing countries. With this discussion in place, let us now shift our focus towards the next article for the day. This article appeared on page 5th of Delhi edition Hindu newspaper, which talks about a new green project, which is going to be implemented in the Rajasthan's park. And this park is Desert National Park, situated in the western part of Rajasthan. Now, this green agro project is going to be funded by FAO, that is Food and Agriculture Organization and Global Environment Facility. For students who are preparing for prelims and who have been through the past prelims paper, they will find that FAO and GEF have found places in the prelim examination multiple times. That is one of the reason why this article becomes important. The second reason being that this article talks about the Desert National Park for which 
prelims related environmental questions could be asked. Now, this project will be implemented by these two important organizations along with the partnership of the government of Rajasthan and government of India. Government of Rajasthan will be involved because this is part of the state of Rajasthan and as it will be implemented in and around the desert national park, it will be under the control of central government. The project will include the participation of the community for the development. It will also call for grassland development in the western Rajasthan, developing or converting the wasteland into irrigated fields. This is important under Indra Gandhi Canal project. This will also provide the employment generation to those people who are as of now relying more on the animal husbandry. So those people can now double their farmer income and can move or shift from just animal husbandry to more lucrative development of crops. And it will also focus on reviving the traditional methods of water harvesting. Now, it is a simple question and I want to ask all the viewers to please comment one of the traditional water harvesting technology which is being used in the state of Rajasthan or maybe in the state of Gujarat. There are multiple of them. You can just comment one in the comment box. With this, let us now also understand something about the Desert National Park. Desert National Park is situated in the area of 3162 square kilometer, which is one of the largest in India. It combines it is situated in the district of Jaisalmer and Badmer. Both of these districts share their border with Pakistan and they are situated in the state of Rajasthan. It was declared under the protected area in 1980. Important flora that is plant species include Khejri, which is protected by the Bishnoi community. This community is also known to protect the wildlife with respect to black buck and chinkara. It also includes some of the open grasses, thorny bushes, rohida, which is also state flower of Rajasthan, komatio and kharojal. The animals included the desert fox, Bengal fox, desert cat, wolf, hedgehog and chinkara. Chinkara is the state animal of Rajasthan. As far as reptiles are concerned, they include the spiny tailed lizard, monitor lizard, saw scaled viper, russell viper and common crate. All these are important because they have been asked or they may be asked in the future by the UPSC because at least one to three questions on important species is being put up by UPSC in the prelim examination. With this discussion please let us now move to the next article for the day. The answer to yesterday's question was option C Jerusalem. Al Aska Mosque is situated in the city of Jerusalem. Today's question is that to consider the following statement and it has three options. Option number one says midday meal is a compulsory scheme to all children studying in government school. Statement number two says it is implemented as central sector scheme. And statement number three says all states have same food menu for children under this scheme. Identify the correct answer from the given option and do comment in the comment box. That's all for today's daily news simplify. Thank you.